Hello everyone, welcome back to Smith's Garage. Now, in today's episode, I'm gonna be going over how I did the body work on my Volkswagen Beetle. Now, in the last video, I talked about how I did all my rust repair around the inside and outside of the car. But in this video, I'm gonna cover how I did the last little finishing touches to make everything look all nice and smooth. Because if you haven't noticed yet, Beetles are completely round. Like, I'm telling you, there isn't a single flat spot on this car. Like, you think maybe that's flat. No, it curves front to back and up to down. It's fully round. Not to mention you got the fenders, the roof, everything's round. There's not a single straight panel on the car. And some people think doing like straight lines, like down a Cadillac are hard. And let me be fair, it is hard but also doing something completely round is hard too. But anyways, so one of the first issues I ran into um, that I forgot to mention in the last video was the top of the car had been flipped upside down and then and so it like collapsed inwards and then somebody took a hammer and hit it back out. So that, was very bad because the roof wasn't smooth and I wanted this roof to be as smooth as a bald man's head. Well, I guess some bald people's heads aren't that smooth. Anyways, um, except it wasn't. And to check that it wasn't, I took a sanding block and sanded off the paint and you could see where there was a bunch of paint left still in all the pits along the roof, which isn't great. So um, I called in a favor from a very helpful person named Neil from b and Hot Rods, you might have heard of him. Um, and he came by and he helped and showed me how to use a hammer and dolly and you tap around the dent to bring the dent up. I swear it was like watching a magician at work. And so he was here for quite a long time and he helped me straighten out the roof. But that was the last step that we did before we actually sent the entire car out to get sandblasted because I did all my metal work before sandblasting so then when it was sandblasted it all was the same there wasn't paint on anything. But the one of the, my favorite parts about when I got it sandblasted is I got them to do an epoxy primer coat over the entire car after it was sandblasted and that meant that it didn't have any time to form any sort of oxide on that bare metal. Cause like sandblasted metal starts to rust really quick, no matter where it is. It just, I don't know what it is about it, but it starts picking up moisture out of the air really easy. So that primer was on there and it was on thick and it's a very hard paint. Like it's a great protective coat to prevent rust. And when we got it like that, it looked great, but there was orange peel, which for those of you who don't know yet, orange peel is that slightly, that slight wave you can see in paint after it goes on. And before getting into this stage, I had no idea about how, I've never used Bondo before. I've never done sanding prime to, it's like priming the body paint, never painted. Well, I, I painted with an air gun before, but I never had done wet sanding after that. So anyways, long story short, that wave, had to come out. So we had to sand the entire car. The paint was like really hard. Like I can't tell you how hard that paint was. It wouldn't, it wouldn't smoothen out very easily. So as we were sanding certain sections of it, we were also putting on some really thin coats of Bondo because in a couple areas we were having some issues and the roof, even though we did straighten it out a lot with a hammer, uh, we did also have to do some skim coats up there, which was hard because of how round everything is. It's just so hard to get like a nice, like a putty knife to get that nice form and laying it down, but you kind of get into a good rhythm of it. As you're working, you kind of start to get a little ahead of yourself almost, not ahead of yourself, but you start to get your body panels on to make sure your alignment's all good. So like the trunk get on, the hood got put on and then you get the fenders on and you start getting excited looking at the car and then the doors are on and then you start getting a little unnecessary with things and then you put the headlights on map out where the turn signals are actually that was important because around this stage we had finished the sanding like the main sanding 
And we, so we put the mapped out where the turn signals go, and then we got the tail lights, and this is where we did that whole mess of trying to figure out how to line up the tail lights properly. And yeah. And you get Bondo everywhere. It's a mess. It's it, This was my least, if there is something I would pay somebody to do next time, if I had the money, it would be to do that part. It was, it was my least favorite. And it was, um, this entire shop had like a film of dust over everything. Um, and my dumbass didn't cover some of the important things, so I had to clean everything. Anyways, and then once it was all nicely sanded, we put our own uh, coat of primer on it, and then sanded it again after that. And yeah, so that was pretty much the entire process of our priming stages. It all went by fairly fast, but truly, like we put in hours and hours and hours of sanding to get the paint to be smooth. Um, and you have to be really careful with the sandpaper as well because you can't get any pieces of grit underneath of them Otherwise, you'll put really deep scratches into the paint, which is no bueno And we did most of it by hand too. We didn't want to use any orbitals or anything uh, And that, that truly was took the longest um, but here's the here's the cool part about what we did and so um I, in sheet metal, I work with a lot with this stuff called Unistrut. Unistrut is this, um, it's kind of like angle iron, but it has, it's U-shaped and it has a bunch of holes along it for hardware to bolt through. And they come in 10 foot lengths. And so what we did was we, we framed up this little room in the corner of our garage using Unistrut. Uh, we just had a piece going up, piece going across, and then a piece going down to connect to all of them. And once we had that frame up, we took a vapor barrier and we laid it over the entire thing and then used tuck tape to tape up our seams. And we got one big fan and put it at one end and then we put some filters in the four corners on the other end. Um, and we turned the fan on and it would suck air through the booth, through the filters. So we literally made a paint booth in the garage. And we even took these, like, we bought these LED lights that were long and skinny, and we set them inside of each piece of Unistrut to get this, like, really nice lighting inside of it uh, that was perfect for painting. Um, that part was actually pretty fun, building the booth. And that, like, literally a day before we started painting, that's when I uh, figured out that I wanted this green color. I was actually going to paint it blue. I was gonna paint it blue for a long time. That was my entire idea through when we built the whole chassis, whole body. Even when I picked out my interior color, I wanted to paint it blue. But at the last second, the day before we bought the paint, I had a change of heart and I changed it to this green. And it actually ended up working out even better than uh, the in with the interior that I had picked. Um, so this color is original 1960s called Mango Green. The color code, uh, I can't, I'll put it up on the screen. I'll put the color code on the screen. I can't remember it right now. Um, and I got it mixed at Lord Co. But I'll go back to what I was saying. Uh, we rolled it into the paint booth and we started painting the green and it was coming out awesome. Um, we had taped off the body of the car. So then we, we, we taped it off. So we painted the inside first and then taped off the inside and painted the outside. We did it in two stints like that because we were worried about having overlaps and then getting runs in the paint. Um, so we did it in two stints. It was a lot of taping, but honestly taping off more, it was better. And you wanna be uh, strategic as to where you put your taping seams. So, cause you can see the seams, but if you put them in like, I put a lot of mine right in the door frame, right in the corner. So you can't even tell that they're there. Uh, so yeah, we, we painted away and this was my only, I wouldn't call it an injury, but the only accident that happened. Uh, what had was happening is when we were wearing these respirators, uh, we had full like painter suits on and respirators, but the respirators have build up condensation on the inside and they drip water. So I thought I was being smart and I put a little piece of paper towel in the bottom of my respirator to soak up water so because I was like deathly afraid of leaning over the car and then having it drip out and then ruining that section of paint. But what ended up happening was 
the little flap that when you breathe out with your respirator, it got stuck open. And so what was happening is when I was breathing in, I was just breathing in straight paint fumes. And I, w I, w I was painting for a couple hours and I was outside of the car wasn't too bad, but where it really hit me was when I was inside of the car painting and the air circulation wasn't as good. And so I started feeling like total shit. So I, I get out of the booth, I take my mask off and I'm sitting outside with a bottle of water and I was breathing out and I could still taste paint. So I took a couple days break from that because I had total paint inhalation. It wasn't that bad. I wasn't, I didn't have any serious side effects, but it was definitely a bit of a scare. So you gotta watch um, how, and I thought I was being safe. I had the respirator, the goggles, the full white hazmat suit. So my way of preventing that was I went and bought a, a different respirator that wasn't just the mask. It was also the full like uh, shield. It looked like I was cooking meth, really. Um, Walter White style, but so I bought that and we, we continued painting and we painted the body, the fenders, everything and the green paint went on really well but we were doing uh, dual stage paint where, or is it single stage? I don't remember. It's the one where you do your green and then you have to do your clear coat over top and we were, I've painted before, we both, me and my dad have both painted and when we paint we usually mix our paint until you pull out your dipstick and you listen to the drips and if there's a certain thing you listen for and that's how we usually mixed up until our thickness but this time we decided to go against that and we went like straight with manufacturer specs with how to mix in the thinner which we thought was smart but what ended up happening was we were planning on wet sanding the car to get it to our finish and so we laid on our clear coat thick. And I'm sure some of you who painted before are already cringing when I say that because this was my big mistake. And what happened was, is because the paint was thicker for one and we laid it on extra thick for two, um, we didn't get any runs, but um, the paint actually needs to off gas. And there's these little bubbles that just come up and then surface and then disappear. But because it was so thick, the bubbles couldn't do that. So if you look up close on my paint, you can actually see they look like little white specks and little divots here and there. Um, it's the one reason, if it weren't for that, this paint would be beautiful. There, you can see it if I come over here. It almost looks like a bit of a metal flake. It's not too bad looking. It, honestly, it actually comes out a lot harder, or like harsher over the camera than it does in person. But uh, so that's the body where I had the main issues, but the fender actually turned out, like all my body pieces turned out a lot nicer. And I'm wondering maybe if I can hit the body harder with some wet sanding, if I might be able to get them out. For my first time doing it, I think it turned out decent. And wet, wet sanding is a really big pain in the ass. Like, it's the same thing as when we were sanding it after the primer. It's truly just so irritatingly difficult it takes forever it your hands will be bleeding and sore and all getting all cracked up because the water that you'll use it will be like caked with um, paint bits in it and then it'll dry on your hand and your hands just get really dry and cracked it's just not a fun experience at all and you really have to make sure you're being careful because not only you need to be wearing your respirator and all that, but you also need to be careful because the second you contaminate your sanding paper with anything, if, even if it falls on the ground, you can't use it because you could put in deep scratches in your paint. Um, and that was truly the, I know I've said it a million times and I'm sorry for repeating myself. It just, I can't believe it's ingrained in my head with how long it took. But, and it's the reason why on the Dodge, the next vehicle I'm working on, it's the reason why I was almost considering doing like a patina on the outside and then painting it nice on the inside was because I just didn't want to wet sand the car. Because you can tell that there's orange peel on it when you're doing all the paint job. So I don't know, maybe I'll save up and get somebody to paint it for me. But long story short, that is what it's like to paint your own car fully. Uh, top bottom like the underside looks just as good as the top side there is attention to detail everywhere 
And as for painting in your own garage, the only reason why we made a paint booth is because we didn't want to get paint on anything else in here, but it worked. Um, funnily enough, I only had one flaw, like true flaw in my paint besides the bug, the uh, dots on it is I had, I had a, a bug land on my bug while I was painting it and it landed right on the hood where the Volkswagen logo goes. So if you look in the crack of the Volkswagen logo, you can see a couple legs of a mosquito, which I find funny because you can't see it. It doesn't, that, I don't know why it doesn't bug me. Usually things like that bug me, but that one makes me laugh. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much for watching. And I'm not sure what my next video will be. I think the next video I've had a couple people ask, I'm gonna make a video about how I picked my rims and tires. And I'm gonna make another video about how I lowered the car and what it's like to drive with a lowered car because it's a, sometimes it's a bit painful, but yeah. So thank you everybody for watching. Consider subscribing. Uh, check out my other videos on what I've done to this car. And yeah, I'll catch you in the next one.